Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Andy, and again, this is UFOs and other paranormal stuff. First things first, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to wish you a very happy new year. Yes, I know it's 21 days into the new year, but this is the first episode since, so... Happy New Year. I hope that 2022 is the best year that there could possibly be for you and your family. Why not make that year happen and really happen uh, by visiting our partners at greatdanes.uk. That's greatdanes.uk. Anything you want, they sell it. My personal recommendation, if you don't mind, is the beer. The Tuborg Gold, Danish Tuborg Gold, is absolutely something to, well, really, really enjoy obviously carefully. So yes, don't forget, have a look at greatdanes.uk. That's G-R-8-D-A-N-E-S dot U-K. Now, as you will know, we're running a little giveaway to win Inside Wright Patterson and Trinity by Jacques Vallée. Uh, two wonderful books about UFO stuff, of course. I'd like to say a massive well done to Tracy, who has won those books. Well done. I hope you enjoy them. They're on the way to you. Also, ladies and gentlemen, I am compiling another Your Stories episode. We did one about, uh, I think it was about a year ago, and you send in your stories to me at UFOs and other paranormal stuff at gmail.com, and I'll read them out on the podcast. It was uh, it was a very popular show, that one. Still in the top ten, I believe. So yes, once again, if you have any, uh, any ghost stories, any uh, poltergeist stories, Anything at all, any personal stuff, just send me the email. Send a, send me an email to UFOs and other paranormal stuff, and I'll read it out on the podcast. Today's episode, ladies and gentlemen, is is a two parter. The first part is is a really good mystery. It's the Great Isle of Mull air mystery. The Isle of Mull is a supremely picturesque island just off the west coast of the mainland of Scotland. It's a beautiful island, part of the Inner Hebrides, and on a nice clear day you, it, you offers you views across the sea to other islands such as Col, Tire, uh, Islay I think that is, Jura, the island that George Orwell lived on and I believe he wrote 1984 on that island, as well as the super historic islands of Skye and Iona. It is a quiet place with many natural things to drive out to and see. Got loads of waterfalls, streams, beaches serve as some of the most beautiful and awe inspiring in the whole of Scotland, or in fact, the whole UK. Then you have the towns. Mull's main town is a place called Tobermory. Tobermory is a colourful port town which relies heavily on its fishing industry as well as the tourist ships that come into the Inner Hebrides too. They pop into Mull, have a look around, and all jump back on the ship again. The colourful buildings that fill the view of Tobermory from the sea are more famously known to children as the houses that residents of Ballamory lived in. Mull, like the rest of Scotland, is steeped in mystery too. During the Viking times, Mull and Iona were the locations for attacks by some sea monsters, according to the Viking stories. Sithshin, i.e. fairies, have apparently been spotted on the islands since those times right up to nowadays. And then of course there were the werewolves and the mer people, the blue men of Minch and the will-o'-the-wisp too. But, ladies and gentlemen, the mystery that I want to talk about today has nothing to do with the Vikings or Mer people or Sith Chains or anything like that. No, having said that, today's mystery is still just as weird as any of them. That mystery is known as the Great Mull Air Mystery, and it took place on the 24th of December, Christmas Eve, 1975. Peter Gibbs was an interesting man indeed. He was a Spitfire pilot and flew the fighter plane with number 41 squadron during World War II, serving between January 1944 
and March 1945. He was a talented violinist throughout the 1950s, 1960s and the early part of the 1970s, even playing in the Philharmonia Orchestra and the London Symphony Orchestra too. An incident occurred in 1956 during his time with the Philharmonia Orchestra when, during a tour of the United States of America, the orchestra felt that the conductor, Herbert von Karajan, had been unprofessional when conducting smaller concerts. During one of the concerts, von Karajan left the stage after the last note was played. He did not wait for applause nor calls for an encore. The musicians in the orchestra were upset by this and that led to Gibbs rebuking the conductor directly, stating, I did not spend four years of my life fighting people like you to be insulted before our allies as you did last evening. Karajan ignored him and continued con to conduct that rehearsal. It was not widely known back then, but Karajan had fought for the Nazis, although to be honest, he probably had been given no choice. Karajan refused to go back on stage after the interval of the night's performance until Gibbs had been sacked. The managers had no choice but to comply and sack Peter Gibbs from the orchestra. Peter Gibbs joined a flying club in 1957 as his love of flying had not withered, nor had his spirit of zest an adventure. He himself owned a de Havilland tiger moth. He was a bit of a practical joker too though, as once he flew over an orchestra and bombed them with bags of flour. In 1975, Peter Gibbs left his professional musician career and decided to enter into the property development business. He had lofty ideas and was making good money too. One of his plans was to buy a hotel that had its own private landing strip so that the rich and famous could be able to arrive and depart by private jet. With that in mind, Gibbs and his girlfriend Felicity Granger flew up to Scotland in December 1975. They stayed at the Glenforsa Hotel on the Isle of Mull and were using a plane to fly between the Inner Hebridean Islands. The Glenforsa Hotel had its very own 780 metre long airstrip, the Glenforsa Airfield, although this was mainly for use by emergency services to and from the island. It is worth noting that the airstrip is just grass, and back then had no runway lights. There was no air traffic control either, and nighttime flying was strictly forbidden. You have to remember too that Mull and Morven generally, the nearby area of the mainland, are very hilly and at night time it is extremely dark there. I know that from personal experience, when out walking there one night, I could not see my way home. I had to use the dot on my iPhone's Google Maps to see exactly where I was. On Christmas Eve, back in 1975, Gibb and Granger flew from Mull to Broadford, on the Isle of Skye to view some more properties. They flew in a Cessna light aircraft borrowed from a friend of Gibbs and the Glenforsa hotel manager at the time, David Howitt. The plane was a Cessna F150H, the registration mark Golf Dash Alpha Victor Tango November. That's G Dash A V T N to you and me. The aircraft was equipped with navigation and communication equipment but was not equipped with any parachutes as in those days they would have been too big for the plane and they would have got in the way of the control stick. Those little planes were quite cramped inside. Gibbs and Granger flew back to the Isle of Mull and to the airfield landing just before 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They rested for a bit, freshened up then went down to dinner. Amongst other things, that dinner included some whiskey and the sharing of a bottle of red wine. Gibbs was reportedly in a very good mood all afternoon and evening, but did express some disappointment in not being allowed to fly the next day, Christmas Day, 
which would have been Gibbs's birthday. Flying was not allowed because a storm was forecast. And so just as they were finishing dinner at the Glen Forcer around 9pm, Gibbs decided that he was going to go out right now and take a solo flight in the Cessna. Gibbs' plan was to see if it was possible to land on the airstrip in the dark. Now remember what I said before about my experience of it being really, really dark there at night? Well, my experience was in summertime. I could imagine that the Hebridean winter darkness would be a completely different thing altogether. Also, according to some reports, the sleet that was coming down was quite heavy at that time. Gibbs went to his room and changed into his flying gear. He returned to the restaurant with two torches, with which he wanted Felicity to guide him back down onto the runway, makeshift landing lights if you will. Hotel workers tried in vain to stop Gibbs taking this very, very dangerous flight in the dark. They could see the dangers of flying in the dark in a very hilly area covered with lots of trees, but he chastised them by saying that he wasn't asking their permission, just merely informing them. He said that he had been a fighter pilot during World War II and that this quick nighttime jaunt was not going to phase him one bit. They went outside and Granger followed Gibbs' instructions to place the torches on either side of the far end of the runway so that he could see where it was in the dark. Some guests, however, reported seeing two people holding the torches instead of one, even though Granger has only ever said that she was the only one to have held them. Some guests also thought that Peter Gibbs took an unusually long time warming up the plane's engine. He was seen to turn the plane's lights off, then on, then off again. Gibbs in the Cessna light aircraft, took off. Hotel guests, thinking that Gibbs was going to make a circuit of the hotel, rushed upstairs to the bar to get a better view, especially as the airfield would likely never be used again at night. They turned the lights off in the bar so as to reduce light reflection on the on the glass and to get a better view of this night flight. Granger stood at the end of the runway holding the torches. The plane sped down the runway. It took off. The plane disappeared behind a line of trees. And Peter Gibbs was never seen alive again. After 10 minutes, Howitt, the hotel's manager, began to worry, fearing that the plane had ditched in the water. He drove out to try and find it and Gibbs, using the hotel's Land Rover to get through the sleet and dipping the car's headlights so as to illuminate the water more. But there was no trace of any plane or any person. An organised search was mounted, but again no trace of Gibbs or the Cessna was found. The search was described as huge and lasted all over the Christmas holidays. The air, sea and land search took place but they could not find anything. There was a thought that maybe some sort of engine failure had meant that the plane had crashed into the sea and had sunk into the Sound of Mull, the body of water between the mainland and the Isle of Mull. This would explain why he could not be found. He was lying dead in the plain at the bottom of the sea. The island was searched fully and completely over the next week or two, but there was still no sign of Gibbs and the plane, despite the police and lots of members of the public searching the remote barren land of the island below his flight path and the RAF and the Royal Navy helicopters scouring the island and the sea from above for any sign, any clues of the wrecked plane. The independent newspaper states that even sonar equipment was deployed to try to find the plane, but nothing was found. Where was Peter Gibbs? Where was the plane? 
It really was as if they had been taken clean off of the face of the planet Earth. But this was only the beginning, and things were going to get weird. Four months after the disappearance of Gibbs and the Cessna light aircraft that he had been flying in, Donald McKinnon, a local shepherd, found a dead body lying part way up a remote hillside one mile away from Glenforcer Airfield. It was indeed the body of Peter Norman Gibbs. Gibbs' body was found lying across a fallen larch tree, 120 metres up the hillside and not far from the only road in that part of the island. The body was facing due north in a direction that indicated Gibbs was walking downhill. Oddly though, searches had passed through this area but found nothing at the time. David Howitt saw the body in situ and immediately confirmed that it was that of Peter Gibbs. It looked as though Gibbs had simply laid down there and died, almost like the man on Somerton Beach in South Australia 20 plus years before. But there was no wreckage, not even one single scrap that might yield a clue as to what may have happened. Stranger still was the fact that the body showed no signs of injuries at all, other than a scratch on one of his legs. In no way did he look like a victim of a catastrophic plane crash. Gibbs' body was taken to Glasgow for post-mortem. No clues were found there that might point to his cause of death. Nothing indicated a fall from a height, and there was no evidence to suggest that Gibbs had died somewhere else and was left on the tree. Incidentally, when removing the body, the police had to cut off several branches of the larch to remove the body. The pathologist's report stated that the condition of the body was entirely consistent with lying out there for a period of four months. Forensic tests found no salt or marine organisms in Gibbs' clothing or boots. If the plane had ditched and Gibbs had managed to get out of the plane in the water, there would have been some evidence of sea salt and marine organisms inside his boots at the very least. Due to the complete lack of evidence, Peter Norman Gibbs' death was noted by pathologists as being due to exposure. The discovery of Gibbs's body prompted investigators to start looking for the plane on land this time and again by searching in woods and dragging locks as well. Don't forget locks in Scotland basically means lakes. Still nothing could be found. Could Peter Gibbs really have survived long enough after ditching the plane in 6 degrees centigrade of water to swim to land in the middle of a Scottish winter with all that slate and everything and walk all the way to and then up a hillside not just battling the cold of the weather but also that of the soaking wet clothes and boots too. That seems like quite a stretch to me, injured or uninjured. In order for Gibbs to have walked from the sea to the hotel, he would have needed to cross the road of which the hotel is on. Why did he not just walk down that road and back to the hotel? Alan Gibbs, Peter's son, is not convinced that his father swam to land then took a little walk up a hill. He told the BBC that he himself tried to recreate that walk up the same hill. He said there was an almost vertical wall of rock between two and three metres high with, f with a few gaps between them to pass. Alan Gibbs hiked up the hill with his husky dog, an eager dog who pulls hard apparently. It took 40 minutes to get halfway up, he said. At some points I had to turn around and go back. Others were very boggy. I could not make it up myself even in daylight, he continued. I would stake every bit of my reputation that nobody swam directly to shore 
and climbed up that hill in the dark. Have you, my dear listener, ever climbed up a hill wearing wet clothes? I have climbed up hills in daylight wearing some slightly wet clothing. I would say that it is impossible to do that and not get any even small bumps or scratches. I'd say it's even more impossible to walk up a hill in the freezing cold with heavy wet clothes on after being involved in a plane crash into the sea, necessitating swimming fully clothed to land and not get a few bumps or scratches. But Peter Gibbs only had that one scratch on his leg. So what happened to him? How was his body not discovered during the searches that took place? And where was the plane? There was absolutely no evidence of the plane at all. Where had it gone? The coroner said that the evidence was consistent with the body being there for four months, yet no one saw it. It is also worth noting that there was no evidence that animals or birds had tried to have a peck at it. And again there was no sea salt on the body or the clothes. If he had swum back to shore, he would have had some on his clothes, at least inside the boots. Surely it would be highly unlikely that there would be no traces of seawater in his boots, no matter what the elements the body endured in the four months it had apparently laid on the hill. But I asked the question again, where was the plane? In 1986, just over 10 years after the accident, two brothers were diving for clams in the Sound of Mull, the stretch of sea between the island and the mainland. They discovered a small aircraft about one mile off the coast of Mull, due east of the Glenforcer airfield, at the bottom of the Sound. The brothers inspected the aircraft and reported later that the disposition of the aircraft indicated a considerable impact. The engine of the plane was some distance away, having detached itself from the frame of the vehicle. A wheel was missing, and the wings had come off and were lying some distance away too. The cockpit's perspex window was out, and both doors were fully locked. For anyone to get out of that plane, they would have needed to climb up and out through the shattered perspex window. In such circumstances, surely it would have been impossible to have done that without injuring oneself more than just a scratch. The plane was not recovered from the sound of Mull, and the photographs that the brothers took of the vehicle were not good enough to allow air crash investigators to see if the crash may have been survivable or not. Some people even say that the photographs are fake. But then in February 2004, some Royal Navy minesweepers undertaking a coastal mapping operation in the waters near Oban, HMS Pembroke, HMS Penzance and HMS Inverness, found a plane 30 metres beneath the surface. Pembroke used a remote underwater camera to take pictures of the wreckage, which was that of a small plane, with the damage being one wing missing. Royal Navy spokesperson Neil Smith said, We think it could be a Cessna, but we have not confirmed that yet. It was discovered later that it was in fact not Peter Gibbs's plane, as the only one found by the Pembroke was a Piper Aztec that ditched in the area 20 years ago. Its crew escaped unharmed. So what happened? Nobody knows for sure. Some still say that Gibbs could not see in the dark and, while returning to the airfield, crashed into the water, got out of the plane, swam back to land, then strangely walked up a hill in heavy soaking clothes instead of taking the only road that there was on that part of the island to the hotel or to a house uh, nearby to call for help. Others have said that Gibbs either saw a UFO too close and jumped out of the plane at low altitude which would surely have shown some more injuries, or that the plane may have hit a UFO while in mid-air, then crashed into the sea. But the weird thing is the body of Peter Gibbs. 
How could he have been missing and the searches with all the hardware and equipment used not have found it for four months? The really odd thing is that this is not the only time that this kind of thing has happened. Have you ever heard of the Zygmunt Adamski case? 6th of June 1980, 56-year-old Zygmunt Adamski went missing while out to get some groceries in Todmorden, West Yorkshire. His body was found on top of a 10-foot high coal pile by a yard worker, Trevor Parker, 20 miles away from where he was last seen. He was found wearing the suit that he had gone out in, but his shirt, wallet and watch were missing. He appeared to have some burn marks on the back of his head and shoulders. This, plus the fact that the coal pile was completely undisturbed, led to speculation that Adamski may have been abducted by aliens. A famous incident also happened to the investigating officer of that case, PC Alan Godfrey, but I will go into that on another episode. Many people now believe that Adamski was abducted by aliens and placed back on Earth on a coal pile, maybe mistaking it for a hill. Many also believe that Peter Gibbs was also abducted by alien beings too and placed back on this Earth, this time on the, on the side of a hill on the island of Mull. As I understand it, the investigation into Peter Gibbs' death has come to nothing, even now. But what do you think happened to Peter Gibbs and the plane that he was flying in? I'd like to hear your thoughts. Please do send them into UFOs and other paranormal stuff at gmail.com. GreatDanes.uk is a unique gift shop that specialises in Danish designed items. We also carry many other Scandinavian products. Cozy comfortable footwear, George Jensen designed jewellery, Eva Solo designed homeware, candles, cups, mugs, clocks, scarves, lights, gadgets, pets, accessories, bags, bimble and bumble toys, eyewear, Christmas decorations, everything you could ever want, and with an unmatched beautiful Danish design to it too. Don't forget the food and drink, salty chocolate licorice, the vintage food grocery box, remoulade, glug mix, and more too. Then why not wash that all down with a nice Alborg Jubileum Aquavit, Gammeldansk Dram, Blomberg Mulled Wine, Tuborg Classic and Tuborg Gold Beer, Carlsberg Black Gold Beer and Soft Drink for the Kids. For worldwide deliveries, visit the website greatdanes.uk That's G-R-8-D-A-N-E-S dot U-K and get your order in today. There's also Lego, of course. Always drink responsibly for T's and C's. Please visit the website. That's greatdanes.uk. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think about that? It is definitely a quite a baffling case. The fact also that it's still like the Summerton Man case has not been uh, solved yet. Next part of this episode is Viking gods. Are they really aliens? Well, in my opinion, and you would have learned this from my earlier episode, uh, episode 9, Religion, COVID-19 and the UFO Countdown, yes, they really are aliens. Again, in my opinion, all gods and their religious figures are aliens who live together on a multi-planet heaven just like Asgard in Norse mythology. Creator Gene Roddenberry stated through the science fiction show Star Trek that those that we thought of as gods and other mystical or religious characters, were actually from other planets and ended up on Earth somehow. For example, the twins in Roman mythology of Romulus and Remus in Star Trek were actually people from the twin planets Romulus and Remus that ended up in Rome, then mythologically built it in a day. Well, my belief is the same. They all exist, but as beings from another planet and can visit here in their spacecraft whenever they want. An example of that I can read straight from the Bible itself, as Ezekiel 1 is what J. Allen Hynek would surely describe as a close encounter of the fifth kind. It goes like this. In my thirteenth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens were opened, 
and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Joachim, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, by the Kibar River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was on him. I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by a brilliant light. The centre of the fire looked like glowing metal and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, their feet were like those of a calf, and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of another. Each one went straight ahead, and they did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had a face of a human being, and on the right side each had the face of a lion, and on the left side the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. They each had two wings spreading out upwards, each wing touching that of the creature on either side, and each had two other wings covering its body. Each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, without turning as they went. The appearance of the living creatures was like burning coals on the fire, or like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures. It was bright, and the lightning flashed out of it. The creatures sped back and forth, like flashes of lightning. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparkled like topaz, and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of four directions the creatures faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved. And when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go, and the wheels would also rise along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked like something like a vault, sparkling like crystal and awesome. Under the vault, their wings were stretched out, one towards the other, and each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved... I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Now you see, ladies and gentlemen, that is directly from the Bible, yet that sounds like a UFO encounter to me. Then we have the Norse and the Old Norse, the Vikings and their strong beliefs in their pagan gods known as the Azir. You have Odin the Allfather, his wife Frigg, sons Thor, Baldur, Vida, and Vali. There is Hoda, Saga, Heimdall, and Tyr too. The list goes on and on. Trust me, these gods could easily fill an underground train all on their own. But the things that they had and the things that they could do with the things that they had were amazing for that time and, well, even for this time too. How did the Norse gods travel around? What about the gods themselves? What about their technology? Well, of course, they used horses as well as their own feet. But horses of the Viking gods were different to normal horses of earth at that time. 
Odin's horse, for example, Slipnir, was, according to the Poetic Edda, an untitled collection of Old Norse poems written by Snorri Sturluson in the 10th century and the Prose Edda, a textbook written in Iceland in the 13th century, that horse had eight legs, four at the front and four at the rear. Was Slipnir of this planet from Asgard or from somewhere else altogether? And what of its parents? Well, the answer to the first question is Asgard. Sleipnir was born on Asgard. The Prose Edda states that when Asgard first came into being, the gods hired a mason to construct a defensive wall. All was agreed, as the mason told them he would build the wall himself, and within three seasons. For their part, the gods would give the mason the sun, the moon, and the goddess Freya. The mason asked if his horse, a stallion, could help him. The gods agreed to that but quickly learned that it was a trick for the stallion had super strength and greatly increased the speed of the wall's construction. The gods, some of whom could be tricky too, decided that they would not pay up their end of the bargain as in their mind the mason had cheated. Of all the gods they chose Loki to find a way to stop the mason from cheating. And the ever so mischievous Loki transformed himself into a mare in order to distract the mason's stallion. It worked, but maybe Loki had some regrets about that. The stallion ran off with him as the mare and was never heard of again. But poor old Loki came home in time to give birth to the eight-legged foal that would grow to become the horse Slipnir, the best of all horses. There are archaeological records of Slipnir. Two of the picture stones from Gotland in Sweden show the eight-legged horse with Odin riding. It is also said that Slipnir was real. Was it real? Well, there are those that say that Odin was in fact real, and did exist on earth as well as in Asgard too, and some of these sightings and stories were recorded in stone. As mentioned before, you had the two rune stones found on the island of Gotland in Sweden, the Tjandvida stone and the Ardred stone. Unfortunately, we'll never know if Sleipnir actually did exist on this planet. Maybe given the parenting of this wonder horse, he may not have been able to have survived any amount of time on the planet Earth, but if those people who think that Odin existed and visited Earth every so often, surely he would have needed a horse to ride when he was off Earth. The Boxstar runestone, however, does show what many believe to be Odin riding a four-legged horse that many think is Slipnir on Earth. So what happened to the other four legs? Loki, Slipnir's mother, was not a god, remember. He was a giant, but was adopted into Odin's family and brought up alongside Thor and the other sons. But Loki was also a shapeshifter too. Could it be that the shapeshifting ability had been inherited by Sleipnir too, and that the horse could change its appearance to having eight legs whenever the need arose to have eight legs? The Boxster runestone also shows something that may really have been technology from another planet. That technology was Gungnir. Gungnir was a spear that Odin carried everywhere, especially into battle. The spear is mentioned in both the Prose Edda and the Poetic Edda too, but it is in the Skaldskapamel section of the Prose Edda that gives more information of this special weapon of mass destruction. It was made by the dwarves. In North mythology, dwarves had special abilities to create the finest and the best of things. Gungnir would definitely fit into that category. Those dwarves, known as the sons of Ivaldi, fashioned the spear under the mastery of the blacksmith dwarf Tvalin, and was obtained from them by Loki, of course. This was part of a reparation for his cutting of the goddess Sif's hair. The spear is described as being so perfectly balanced that it will hit every target its thrower wants it to hit, no matter the strength 
or the skill of that thrower. Could it be that Gungnir is some sort of small yield guided missile, made by an alien race who were at that time much further advanced than we are even now? Were those dwarves really some alien engineers working away on their planet, or UFO, to give Odin his super futuristic weapon? Well, that may be so. Gungnir wasn't the only great thing that the skillful dwarves created. Among the wondrous creations made by the dwarves after a bet from Loki that they couldn't make anything better than those of the sons of Ivaldi could, they made Gullimbusti, the golden boar for Freya, Skiblodnir, Freya's ship, Dropnir, Odin's ring, and the most famous of all, Mjolnir, Thor's hammer. We have all heard of Mjolnir thanks to Marvel films and comics recreation of the Viking god Thor. Mjolnir was forged by the dwarf blacksmith Sindri and Broca after a bet by Loki that they could not create better things than the other dwarfs, the sons of Ivaldi. But he was wrong. The problem was that Loki hadn't bet money, he bet his head. Yes, he bet his head. He was okay when the first two items were made, but when Mjolnir was created, he started to get a little bit worried. As Sindri placed the iron for the hammer into the forge, his brother Brokir went to pump the bellows. Loki decided that this would be the best time to try and sabotage their work, and so transformed himself into a fly, and bit Brokir on the eyelid, enough that it drew blood. The blood ran into Brokir's eyes and he could work no longer as he could not see properly. Brokir never worked again. All that commotion made Sindri lose concentration on his work. When he took the hammer out of the forge he then realised to his horror that the handle was much shorter than planned, meaning that the hammer could only be wielded with one hand instead of the normal two. It turned out not to matter. Everyone agreed that Mjolnir was the finest object ever made. Mjolnir, like Gungnir, could do wonderful things, but only Thor could pick it up and use it. Whatever Thor wanted his trusty hammer to do, it did. I must say I would like one to help me with the DIY at home. It would certainly make it a lot easier. But again, was this hammer a super future weapon created by aliens, the gods and their dwarven friends. The stories of Molnir in the Eddas tell of a hammer that had mighty power and could even crush mountains and did so on its way to crushing the Jotun, which was the giants. But again, the question is, was Mjolnir real? The answer may not be what you would expect. According to the local.se, Swedish News in English, archaeologists called to the depths of the City Bannon Tunnel project in the Stockholm in March 2013 were stunned to find what they believed to be Mjolnir, the hammer of the Norse god Thor. The hammer was found in the granite bedrock of Sodermalm Island in Stockholm, where engineers are excavating a tunnel to redirect the suburban commuter trains in one of the capital's biggest infrastructure investments since the metro was built. It was a case of shock and awe when one of my engineers recognised engravings on the object to be Norse runes, project manager Johan Labour told the local. At first I thought it was piping sticking out of the ground, added Rav Pidotini. Upon closer inspection, the object was discovered to be a handle, not piping. But as the Indian-born excavation expert was not familiar with Norse myths, he didn't recognise what turned out to be rune writing. The excavation team then alerted management, who in turn asked City Hall for guidelines. Much of the project has focused on keeping vibrations from blasts at a minimum in order not to damage architectural landmarks above the ground. Although analysts have yet to identify the metal, experts have told Stenana it was likely a complex alloy, 
as there was no oxidization on the surface of the giant hammer. The object, engraved in intricate runes and lightning bolts, measures more than 60 centimeters from handle to head. Once removed, experts said it would likely weigh more than 50 kilograms, because half of the hammerhead is still stuck in the bedrock. Archaeologists have said they do not want to release the translation of the runes to the public before they can get access to the entire text. Archaeologists called to the city balance scene were completely floored by the new find. If there had been an existing cavern here, we would have no doubt assumed that this was a copy of Mjolnir used by Viking leaders in rites and ceremonies, said Lurdgit Undresun, chairman at the Norse Myth Appreciation Society in Boros. The object, however, was found partially encased in granite. A specialist archaeological team with experts called in from Iceland and Denmark and niche Swedish smiths have ordered that the hammer remain in the tunnel until some initial tests can be run. So what do you think of that? How could this hammer with its runes have gotten into the bedrock of this Swedish island? I'm no expert at all, but looking at the, on the internet, uh, the bedrock can be quite a way down in the ground. So Mjolnir could in fact be real, but we will never really know whether Mjolnir found in Sodomon is real or not until Thor comes back to claim it, just like in one of the films. Ancient aliens assert that the hammer in Norse mythology does not actually cause explosions, but it is the physical force that destroys the object. That, today, is described as kinetic weapons. One more of the weirdly interesting and very technologically advanced items in the Norse gods' inventory, also made by those skillful dwarfs, Freya's ships Skiblodnir. Could this ship, the best of ships, have actually been a UFO? Loki, as mentioned, is trying to make up for one of his acts of mischief. He cut off Freya's hair by giving Freya a ship called Skiblodnir. But Skiblodnir was no ordinary ship. It was the finest craft ever made. It could go anywhere that Freya wanted it to go. And it could go super fast too, even if there was no wind. It was big. It was really big. It is said that it could fit all of the Azir inside it, along with all of their horses and all of their weaponry too. But if needed... Skiblodnir could be folded up so small that it would fit in your pouch and it could be carried around. Imagine that, a small tiny folded up piece of wood in a pouch. Unfold it and you have the greatest ship that ever sailed the seas. That type of technology sounds to me very out of this world. As we have heard in this podcast and other media, sightings throughout history haven't always described UFOs as flying saucers. The descriptions of strange aerial phenomena have usually been made by people with absolutely no idea of far futures technology. It would be like caveman trying to work out a train if a train went through a time tunnel into the caveman times. You know what I mean. Maybe Skiblodnir was a UFO that was able to shapeshift like Loki. Now... Who exactly might these ever so skillful dwarves have been? Just simply looking it up on the internet will show you some very old pictures of these small people. Some pictures show them with large heads and spindly legs and arms, with larger than what would seem usual eyes. Could it be that these dwarves, who seem to have natural ability to create these absolutely wonderful things such as Gungnir, Skiblodnir and Mjolnir, really be the famous great aliens that so many people talk about having seen in real life? If so, does that mean that the gods really do exist and have been working alongside the great aliens for possibly millions or billions of years? That, ladies and gentlemen, is a question that I would love to see a positive answer to. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, again, what do you think of all that? That is a lot to take in. It was a lot of research, I'll tell you. But as always, it was fun to do it. I love doing it. Let me know your thoughts on the show. Let me know your thoughts on this episode. Again, send in everything you have to UFOs and other paranormal stuff. And until the next episode, I'll speak to you very soon. Take care. Also, don't forget, if you would like to sponsor my podcast, please do send me an email to UFOs and other paranormal stuff. Thank you very much. Take care. GreatDanes.uk is a unique gift shop that specialises in Danish designed items. We also carry many other Scandinavian products. Cozy comfortable footwear, George Jensen designed jewellery, Eva Solo designed homeware, candles, cups, mugs, clocks, scarves, lights, gadgets, pets, accessories, bags, bimble and bumble toys, eyewear, Christmas decorations, everything you could ever want and with the unmatched beautiful Danish design to it too. Don't forget the food and drink, salty chocolate licorice, the vintage food grocery box, remoulade, glug mix and more too. Then why not wash that all down with a nice Alborg Jubileum Aquavit, Gammeldansk Dram, Blomberg Mulled Wine, Tuborg Classic and Tuborg Gold Beer, Carlsberg Black Gold Beer and Soft Drink for the Kids. For worldwide deliveries, visit the website greatdanes.uk. That's G R 8 D A N E S dot UK. And get your order in today. There's also Lego, of course. Always drink responsibly for T's and C's. Please visit the website. That's greatdanes.uk.